Welcome to Agile to Agility Podcast with Milan Bayic. Major show alert. The very first value we wrote is individuals and interactions. Let's take this to another level. You need your employees to be a human sensor network that you can deploy in real time because you need to assess test the situation from a multicultural, multiple experience, multi-cognitive background. And you need to see patterns and outliers in that. You can't afford to spend three months commissioning research. So the first question, Dave, here, what does a leader need to develop in order to sense complexity and navigate it, navigate on it effectively? What inner work has to be done? Uh, I mean, uh, if, if I was being particularly pedantic here, I'd say if they don't already have that knowledge, then they shouldn't be in a leadership position in the first place, all right? Um, so th there is this really strong and I think really dangerous tendency to try and define competences. Um, the idea is it, it's kind of like this computer model of the human brain. You know, if this person has these competences, they can do this, all right? Mm -hmm. The reality is we can all exhibit leadership in different contexts. So let me be a bit more positive, all right? So there isn't a one size fits all. Uh, this was my big debate, well, one of my many debates with Steve Denning when he wrote Radical Leadership, yeah. in that he tried to shoehorn lots of different leaders working in lots of different contexts into a single model and say all radical leaders have to have these qualities. Now, you know, if, if you look at GE, Apple, and IBM, I work with all three of those CEOs, and the only thing that they had in common is they were arrogant bastards yeah. And yeah, I don't see anybody writing a book about arrogant bastardry, the secret to leadership success. All right. But that's the reality of it. So I think, I mean, there's a couple of things we've said. I mean, the EU field guide has got a lot on this. It basically says lead, leadership is about coordination, not decision making. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I was sea level in my life. And one of the things you learn the hard way is the, the more you get promoted, the more you only meet angrier and angrier customers and the fewer decisions you actually get to make. Mm -hmm. And you're even, you know, you're incompetent to make them anyway because you're not that close to the field anymore. So your role is really much more coordination, linkage. Have you talked with this person? Will come back to me when you have. Yeah, th those are the sort of things you're doing. Um, the difference is when you get a real crisis and then you have to make decisions. You have to make them very quickly or based on inadequate information. And that's where we say what you do is you make decisions to increase the options available downstream. You don't try and re resolve the problem. Your role is to increase the options available to, to create some stabilization by which your experts can then start to make decisions again. Yeah, so that's, that's one thing. The other big thing, and the thing I'm working on at the moment, to be honest, some people just seem to have this and some people don't, is what I call anticipatory thinking. Um, and I'd love to find a way of measuring this or training for it. But some people just seem to be able to do small things now, which make a big difference downstream, even though the link isn't clear. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, now, you learn this interesting in mountain navigation. You learn it. I'll give the illustration. So somebody said to me the other day, all right, how the hell did you find this track? And I said, well, and I suddenly thought, well, how did I find it? I mean, it's just obvious. And then I thought it through and I said, well, for the last two hours, I was looking at the hill ahead and looking for patterns because I've grown up to do that. And I'm constantly looking ahead and thinking, well, that's more risky and this more risky and if, you know, that you get that pattern. you get, And it's, th that comes with that experience. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So there's a key framework within Canavian called ASHEN, A-S-H-E-N. And that stands for Artifact Skills, Heuristics, Experience and Natural Talent. And the way you look at any quality is you say, well, you know, what are the artifacts? Because artifacts you can train people to use. Yeah, spreadsheets, processes. What are the skills? Skills you can train people on. Yeah. yeah. Then you get into heuristics and habits and rituals, which I've written about this Christmas. All right. And rituals and habits are ways of reducing the energy cost of knowledge transfer. So they're normally achieved through repetition. Right? And there's nothing wrong with that. That's actually really important in knowledge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then you get experience. Now, 
very few leaders these days have the right experience. When I applied to be a general manager, this is in a software company, um, I had to do a year in sales, a year in support, and a year in production and hit my targets before I was even allowed to be considered as a general manager. Right. And, you know, if you've done a year in sales and you, you can't, I mean, I know what it's like not to be able to bloody pay the mortgage because I haven't made a sale this quarter. You understand selling in a way that you can't if it's just abstract. And what we now have is people do an MBA straight out of business school, which I don't think you should allow. They go and join a big consultancy firm where everything is about spreadsheets and reports. And then they go sideways into management with no practical experience. So kind of like the question you should be asking is what combination of artifact skills, heuristics, experience and natural talent that we have, do we have that and how do we substitute for it? And it's quite critical on replacement, by the way. So sorry, I've just seen you, but I haven't seen you for ages. All right. So if I say, you know, how do I replace Olaf? That's the wrong question. The right question is Olaf has, has this combination of you know, artifact skills, heuristics, experience and natural talent. How do we replace that? All right. And that's a very different way of formulating the question, but it's a way of formulating the question the way you can do something about it. Yeah. Uh, maybe just to expand on this new work and the work that has been done, I think uh, Thomas, I don't know if he's here, but I think what he was probably alluding to is towards like cognitive development and like what is the what is the relationship between uh, cognitive capacity and uh, uh, you know, how you sense complexity. Um, I'd be very nervous about that because we're embodied creatures anyway. So, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, if you read Anil Seth's latest work, he's basically arguing that consciousness is a process of controlled hallucinations and is, and is based in the body. So we, we know a lot of our decisions are made, and that's why I went down the ashen route, all right? It's not a cognitive issue per se. Right. There are some interesting things that we can learn from. One of the things that you see, for example, in military environments is a distinction between NCOs and officers. Yeah, you see the same in hospitals with nurses and doctors. And that's quite interesting because you have one group of people who acquire experience, then get taught theory. And you get another group of people who start with theory and then get practice. Yeah. And they work in combinations. Right? So I think it's much more about what interactions and experience and context do you need people to live through rather than trying to define specific cognitive functions, which is tech. And I'm not sure there's any evidence really to support any context that there are a set of cognitive functions, which are ideal. You also then get into this thing that Nora Bates and I, which are hitting really heavily at the moment, which regrettably is too common in the coaching movement is adult development models. Yeah which are deeply manipulative, right? Um, which actually have no basis whatsoever in any real science. They all go back to Piaget and Piaget's experiments. People have tried to replicate them and got completely different results, right? And they end up privileging the person at the top of the hierarchy. You see this with things like spiral dynamics. I, rem I remember I had this with bloody Kent Beck. I'm turquoise, you're an angry blue. Well, that's just a way of avoiding the bloody problem for God's sake, right? Yeah. Um, so the reality of all of these things interact and work in different ways in different contexts. And there are some contexts where, the, I mean, the army is really good at this, by the way. There are contexts, for example, in a weapon sergeant can outrank a general. Yeah. All right. So military environments have worked out how to delegate authority without loss of status. And that's what we call a crew, which is something we've been taking sideways into industry as well. Now, to me, you should stop talking about people and you should talk about roles and role interactions it is, is a much better way of talking about the problem. So uh, maybe, uh, I don't know if this is uh, uh, what I'm taking from this, but uh, based on what I'm hearing you say is that it really comes down to experience as far as dealing better with complexity and uh, no, it, 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 it's you can do a lot with artifacts yeah you can do a hell of a lot with artifacts all right um tools instruments processes i mean i, I did a lot on you know head up display design for fighter pilots when i was a coder and you do a hell of a lot with structure there to augment cognitive so we can do a lot with those all right 
-hmm. So it's not that there is one thing or one set of things. Probably the most important phrase that anybody who knows anything about complexity will use a lot is please stop proposing context-free solutions in a context-specific world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Different things work in different contexts. And what we've had for the last 30 or 40 years is every management movement, including Agile, has tried to create a context-free universal solution. I mean, the work we're now doing, for example, in Agile is to break methods down to their lowest coherent component, then allow them to recombine and combine across different vendors because you scale a complex system by decomposition to the lowest level of coherent granularity and then recombination. That's how DNA works. Yeah. But everybody wants to scale by, did it work for so-and-so? I'll do the same thing. And then you get the great error of the Spotify model. Yeah, I mean, yeah which, is, which is made worse by the fact that nobody any good in Agile wants to work for McKinsey's anyway. So they end up with a second rate. Of, sorry, I'm being deliberately pejorative to make a point here. And then they say, yeah, adopt the Spotify model. Well, yeah, Spotify lived through a complex set of journeys, which were different in Stockholm from New York anyway. Yeah. yeah, and some of their practices are constantly shifting and changing. You can't adopt the outcome of an emergent process. You have to create the same, you create similar starting conditions and see where your journey takes you. And that's that decomposition and recombination. So how yeah, you learn from the past, but the level at which you learn it is a, it, it's a finely grained level of learning. It's it's not a total learning, not a total system learning. Well, we seem to be like it, you know, one thing feeds another. And this is like where companies want these prescriptive frameworks. They want that. So like they're being fed. So how do we get to the point where we realize that like, hey, you know, none of these frameworks, like you said, you know, everything needs to be contextualized. And that, uh, yeah. well, do, do you, I mean, it, it's interesting. And I had the privilege of teaching leadership with Peter Drucker, all right, which was a huge privilege before he died. Yeah, and one of the reasons I did that is I made the mistake at a conference in San Diego in the Hotel Dell, and I can still see the situation. I did something a lot of agile people did. I was young and inexperienced. That's my excuse. And I said complexity <laughs> took us beyond Taylorism. And I mean, if you ever remember that famous vice presidential debate when it's I knew, you know, Kennedy, I got that, all right? If you've ever been taken apart by a 93-year-old genius on a public platform in front of 2,000 people, I ended up as a puddle of humiliation on the stage. He decided I was redeemable, so they took me out for dinner, and then I actually talked with him for a long period. Right? And one of the conclusions we came to, and I stopped criticizing systems thinking and because actually, when people talk about Taylorism, they're actually talking about system thinking. They're talking about all the things which came in in the 80s and 90s with things like business process re-engineering and Six Sigma. If you actually go back to Taylor and you bother to read Taylor, he was trying to humanize the workforce. If you look at what it was like before Taylor, and we all now look at what Taylor produced and said, that's terrible. It was a damn sight better than came before. All right, and he was trying to humanize it by removing the mechanical side. So what Drake and I ended up coming to the conclusion on is complexity theory and scientific management have a lot in common, and they both differ radically from systems thinking and its derivatives because they both respect human judgment. If you actually go back to, to Taylorism, management is an apprentice model of management. Yeah, it's, it's, and what happens with systems thinking is an attempt to reduce human judgment completely from the equation and make everything processes and competences and structures and measurement. Yeah, there were no three or five year plans until systems thinking came in. I mean, the irony of US companies adopting the planning cycle of Soviet Russia is always, I found ironic, all right? Um, the reality is you had people with lots of experience who adapted to things as they went along and did some long-term things and did some risks. And, you know, they'd grown, you know, they had, they brought in new blood from time to time, but the majority of people like Japanese companies still to this day were there for life. So they built the relationships and they were committed to the company long-term. Now we're bringing back that type of decision-making in the work we're now doing on complexity. Mm. So I... I I, was, I, I know last time we had this conversation and I didn't get a chance to follow up on it, but is it that we butchered the idea of systems thinking because we tried to... Uh, no, it's, it's systems, on, systems thinking was ontologically flawed from day one. 
Uh, could you I, make no, I say this, all right? I, I did a lot with cybernetics, and I did. I had. I owe a huge debt to Peter Chaplin for soft systems. Mm -hmm. yeah? um, and in terms of where we were with the eighties and nineties, it made a lot of sense because we didn't know about complexity theory then. All right, and yeah, you know, if you look at it and you look at systems dynamics, it's all feedback loops and structure. And these nice little general statements about you should look at the system as a whole, right? Mm -hmm. And so what you see with systems thinking also comes in, it's dominated by engineers and by information processes. So things like Ashby and Shannon, that's where it comes from, yeah? Mm -hmm. And of course, engineers don't like ambiguity and uncertainty. Yeah, and therefore we get re-engineering the corporation. And the famous thing at the start of you know, Hammer and Shamfrey's book, nothing that has happened in the past has any relevance to the future. That's what it says. Mm -hmm. And so what we want is a greenfield site when we're building on a brownfield site. So this, this evolutionary, we're, we're now shifting into these more ecological frames. So from my point of view, I've, uh, there's a huge debt. I've said many times that there's no way that Stafford Veer would have produced VSM if he'd known about complexity theory. It's a brilliant piece of work in the context of what was known at the time, but you know, so what? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you know, this is, you know, people say, well, systems thinking address complexity. Well, yes, it did. Human, the human race addressed the gravity with canals, but then Newton came along and we understood the science, at which point we can do things differently. All right. Okay. So, I mean, that, that's an ongoing debate. All right. But I think <laughs> the, the problem is systems thinking is transitionary. All right? There's still things in it which have value, but it's not a universal. All right. And it doesn't handle, I mean, it's quite interesting. I mean, you listen to Gerald Midgley, I was listening to the other day. All right. This is one of the doyens. He says, the definition of a system is something which has boundaries and is based on human perception. Well, from a complexity point of view, systems are devised by coherence, not by boundaries. Some systems don't have boundaries. And we also, this is materialism, we actually know that things actually exist. It's not just about human perception. So if a human being wants to say a system is something when it's something different, that's rather like treating young creationists as they should be, if, as if their argument should be accepted seriously. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's the old phrase used with postmodernists is reality exists, live with it. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, let's transition to, I think we could spend more time on, on this, but essentially what you're saying is, uh, focus more on complexity and complexity management rather than yeah, and the agile community. The, the good news is you can. I mean, there, there's this totally spurious debate between social constructivists and critical realists. Both, you know, the critical realists grew up as counters to social constructivism. Well, it turns out both of them are wrong. Yeah, I mean, yeah, aspects yeah. of the world are socially constructed and aspects aren't. So we we got much better science now. And the trouble is, people are holding to outdated models, they're not moving on the modern understanding from a scientific point of view. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you for taking time to answer that question. Let's move on to the next one. Um, what do you think will be the future of corporate strategic approaches? Is the second one here. We First of all, I think you're gonna move from long-term planning. So Porter was the arch priest of strategy. Yeah, in the systems period. Um, and I think in, in some ways that that was a pity. I mean, I think Henry was actually much better, but Porter produced a structure and a recipe which was easier to follow. Mintzberg handled ambiguity better. And I think Mintzberg gets complexity. Mm -hmm. So I think strategy now starts, uh, there's two or three things. First of all, Situational assessment needs to be distributed. Again, one of the things we outlined in the EU field guide is you need your employees to be a human sensor network that you can deploy in real time. Because you need to assess test situation from a multicultural, multiple experience, multi-cognitive background. And you need to see patterns and outliers in that. You can't afford to spend three months commissioning research because things are changing too quickly. Yeah. The new stuff we're doing on um, structure theory and physics, papers just come out on that, is to say, well, you can, and this is what we're calling the estuarine framework, and the estuary model is a good one, because in an estuary, things flow both ways, dependent on the tide. And there are sort of granite cliffs, which are stable, and there are sandbanks, which change constantly. 
and you often have to read clues from the surface level of the water. So I think where strategy is going to go is into that sort of ecological metaphor of what's stable, what isn't stable, how frequently do we need to assess it, where are the outliers? Um, and then therefore, where do we start to deploy energy? And probably this is one of the most important things that comes out, certainly my approach to complexity, whatever has the lowest energy gradient will win. Yeah? If you want to put that in moral terms, you know, if, if the cost of, cost of virtue is less, is more than the cost of sin, people will sin. Right? So in strategy terms, if you want customers to buy your product, the energy cost of buying your product has to be less than the energy cost of buying a competitor's. Mm -hmm. And notice I'm saying energy cost, not necessarily price. And I'll give you an illustration of this. After IBM took us over, which was completely unexpected, I was sent on a mission to explain to IBM salesmen why we always asked them to bid. We were a systems integrator, but we never worked with them. Mm -hmm. right? And so... Well, happy to do that. So we went and said, well, we always asked you to bid because you were always the most expensive and you gave us the most material which we could put into our proposals. But we didn't work with you because you didn't understand what a systems integrator is about. So you tell us your kit was faster. Well, we know so bloody what, right? I mean, we're going to put this together with lots of other kits with lots of software. The differences you're talking about are just disappear in the noise, right? Uh, whereas Sun have said, if we ever need a faster processor because the client does it, they'll just upgrade the processor without an argument. Mm. So they've removed, they've shared our risk. So we're going to go with them, even though the kit isn't as good as yours, but they've taken away our risk. And I said, HP, put three people into our library and help us write bids. So are you surprised? Because our bid costs we need to reduce. Are you surprised that we end up with HP kit on the proposal? because they've reduced our energy cost of bidding. I said, you're not looking at the complete process. You think it's just produced a better mousetrap, and it isn't, mm -hmm. right? It's all the relationships and everything about it. So look at the total energy cost of what you're trying to do and manage that energy. And that's what we're doing with the S-Drive mapping is map the energy gradients of the system so you can see what's more likely or less likely. And then that becomes kind of like the new approach to foresight is actually to map the evolutionary potential of the present, not forecast the future. Yeah, Because that way you can see what's likely to change and what isn't likely to change. And it's also links in with, sorry, I'm throwing a lot of stuff around, but it's a long day. What we call the frozen two approach to strategy. Right. So this, this will at least will be memorable. Adjacent, is that the one? That's it. So basically, if you haven't watched Frozen 2 now, this is your excuse to go and watch it, even if you haven't got young children or grandchildren. Yeah, Frozen 2 is a great movie. Frozen 1 is just Disney, all right? But it was so successful, they had enough money to do Frozen 2 properly, so they had fun. And there's this wonderful moment in the middle of Frozen 2 where the real heroine of the Frozen series, who's the younger sister without magic, all right? Yeah, left in a position where she thinks her older sister and the snowman have lost, sings, all I can do is do the next right thing. Right? Now, in Stuart Kaufman, that's called the adjacent possible. All you can do in complexity is map where you are and identify which next steps are coherent. And then you move into those next steps and you look again. So strategy becomes much more contingent. Yeah. Now, if you have to invest over a 15 year cycle, you're taking bigger bets, right? And that's a whole different process. But for most people, particularly in software development, you're talking about something which is much more dynamic. As stabilities emerge, you stabilize them. Yeah? It's why we're going back to a lot of the old OO stuff, for example, but starting to talk about organizational units as objects as well as software. So you define your objects and you define the interactions. So you create stability in those definitions. But then the way that things interact with other things can actually respond very quickly to unexpected circumstances. And that's called getting the granularity right. So you build your organization in smaller units with defined interactions and with fast feedback loops. So effectively, you're managing emergence rather than trying to plan forward. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it seems like you're also keeping things simple, or at least you try yeah. to keep things simple, right? 
Um, it's, it's why I use children metaphors a lot. I mean, the children's party story is still the best teaching story I've ever created, and it explains complexity. But it also makes this subtle point is everybody manages complexity in their day to day lives. So you know how to do it. Uh, we just forget about it when we walk through the doors of the office. Correct. And we manage complexity with simplicity. We don't most for most of us, I guess, we don't manage it with yeah. complexity, right? But there's a big difference between being simple and being simplistic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and too many people confuse the two, right? I mean. It's actually a big problem in America and the UK is the anti-intellectualism of management education is really scary. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't have people with sound theory, you can't make things simple. Yeah, you just go with what worked last time and that's being simplistic. Yeah, in, in, yeah it's called praxis, theory informed practice. Great. Um, Mary, Maru, if you could please just put the questions in the uh, in the uh, uh, tool. I just added the link again, but it's also an email. Um, Dave, what is your favorite case study or usage of Canadian? Um, uh, there's a couple, all right. There's there's a really good one in Helsinki. <laughs> I mean, I got this weird email in sort of Finnish English, all right, which said, we've been using your framework, would you like, and I was actually going, so I met them, right? And they'd used it to understand teenage violence in the Baltic states in what's a brilliant project. They just published a book. And I'm actually quite proud of that because they did it without me being involved. I mean, they've been on training since, yeah. There was another one, I got a phone call from the cabinet office in the UK. So that's the prime minister's office. We said we just, and they'd actually use Kinevin to explain the role of religion in the Bush White House. That's a published paper, yeah. right? Um, and I'll never forgot that because the woman who wrote it phoned me up and she said, I'm convinced you've read Karl Rahner because he's all the way through this. And I said, oh my God, I studied under him. Is it that obvious? We don't know Karl Rahner was a Jesuit philosopher behind Vatican II. So. There's some of that in Kinevin. So I think, I, I wouldn't say there's a favorite. I would say one thing I'm proudest of is if you go and search for Kinevin on Google Scholar, 90% of the papers there will be people using the framework without us involved. Mm -hmm. yeah? And that means it's got utility, right? So the cases will be contextual. Great. Uh Another, maybe just to add to this, uh, that you talked about like making this available to everyone. Last time we spoke and you said like, you know, in context like this, and this was like last year, uh, making Canavan and all the tools uh, available to uh, others. Could you maybe elaborate on that and how that helped maybe, or has that changed anything since last year, since you're- Yeah, we went, we went to open source on the methods. So there's a Canavan wiki now. Yeah. Yeah, so everything there is open source. Progressively over the next nine months, we're going to go complete open API on the software as well so that we can create a development community. Um, and the reason we're doing that, to be honest, is, is simple knowledge of life cycles. When you're creating something new, you hold it tight, otherwise it gets corrupted. Mm -hmm. When the market starts to take off, you open it up fast because you want, you, you want lots of people adopting and copying. So we're, we're going down that route. The other big thing we're doing in Agile, we this concept of decomposition and recombination. Um, and I'm working with um, Comic Agile and also with um, at least with about eight or nine other people. We're taking all of the different Agile methods and breaking them down into their lowest component parts and producing a complete facilitation kit for that. Yeah, um, And we're branding that with an independent brand. It's not branded Kinevin. So our methods are branded Kinevin. Mm -hmm. But the core pack has got an independent brand. And so that means you could, for example, take Scrum. I'll give the example I keep giving. You could peel out Sprint and replace it with three-month time box. Mm -hmm. right? So, and I'll put a picture in the, in the chat in a minute so you can see them. So the, this is designed to be an alternative to things like Safe, right? Which we need an alternative to the Borg. Um, because... What it basically says is there are individual things in virtually all of the methods and all of the concepts, and we just need to use them in different combinations. 
-hmm. Yeah, so a multi-method, multi-vendor, not single framework is, is what we're trying to drive. Yeah, yeah. and that, I think that's where we are kind of headed. And I spoke recently with Jorgen Appello and he was kind of, I don't know if you've seen what he's been doing with Unfix, but essentially just saying like, we need to kind of- re <laughs> You mean the magpie? <laughs> Uh, I think, I mean, like, I don't know, it, it's been interesting because I think he's saying the same thing in a sense, like that we need to stop getting away from frameworks and looking. No, at he isn't. That. He's trying to create his own framework. Look at the last picture he produced. What Jürgen does is he reads extensively. I mean, the problem with Jürgen is he's got the intelligence to do it properly, but he chooses <laughs> not to. Yeah. All right. So he grabs things from lots of people, throws it together, puts some pretty pictures around it and sees if this one will sell. Yeah. So he put up his alternative to safe the other day. And to be quite honest, it's comical. <laughs> All right. I mean, you know, you talked about, sim yeah, th that, that's the trivial end of our job. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, well, let's move on. No, I agree. I think, you know, it's, uh, I, I think we need to keep be pushing and, uh, you know, challenging the current status quo with the frameworks and everything. But uh, I'll take that over the alternatives. But um what uh, th this next question here is from Doug Doug's here uh do well connected teams uh perceive complexity complexity different than an individual yeah and i think the the essence is we we actually evolved as collective creatures so we evolved for extended families and tribes and part of the problem you've got in northern <laughs> europe and north america um which manifests really scary in north american politics with libertarianism Mm -hmm. is the entire focus on the individual. Um, one of the, the key things in complexity is <laughs> defined by our interactions, not by anything innate to ourselves. Mm -hmm. If you want to change people, stop talking about mindset, which is bad science anyway, and change people's interactions. It's cheaper, it's more ethical, and it produces bigger change. So seeing things in terms of high levels of connectivity, interaction, the ability to change those interactions, is a much better approach to change and it's better based in science anyway. So you're saying change the change the environment? Change the environment, change the connectivity. Yeah. Well, what, what matters is, I mean, you think about it, I'll, I'll give the children back. What do you most worry about when your kids hit puberty, who their friends are? Yeah. Because now their interactions are changing from you to third parties and who they are will change them for life, right? So interactions matter more. There, there are no innate qualities in human beings. It's why things like Myers-Briggs are complete pseudoscience. Yeah, we're highly adaptive. We can change very quickly and we change based on our interactions and our social interactions. Mm -hmm. It makes sense when we first moved to the United States that, uh, and I was a teenager, uh, that's what my parents were mostly worried about. Uh, who I was hanging out with, not how late I was staying and all of that. Yep. <laughs> um, let's see here. Uh, did your consultancy for military UK government add environmental positive impact like social responsible value? Um, that's a very broad question, right? So, uh, and I'll, I'll say a couple of things. First of all, my experience of working with military, and I've taught just war theory at West Point. I work at Quantico and on the big C2 command thing. And I've got no military experience, but I'm now considered an expert on military decision making, which is quite scary if you think about it. Mm -hmm. um, is military people are more ethical than non-military people? I still remember teaching this at West Point. West Point, they're very bright kids, all right? They genuinely worry about what, it, what about killing people because they know they're going to have to do it, all right? So they've evolved various mechanisms on that. And, you know, I argued a long time ago, military trained people on ethics. Software engineers are never trained on ethics. Mm -hmm. But the implications of software engineering to society are really scary. And it's a lot of, you know, it's like the, the role of AI. And the trouble is too much of AI, so I use my favorite phrase, is written by misogynist males on the West Coast of the USA who take Anne Rand seriously after puberty, which is grounds to be committed to a mental hospital. Uh, the, the cultural bias behind a lot of software development is really very scary. Look what happened with Google. I mean, look at, read the Scholastic's Parrots paper. 
right, which is a brilliant paper, and the woman who published it gets fired, right, because she pointed out the degree to which the training data set was being ignored by Google. Yeah, and yeah, this is, I mean, I've been in AI all my life, right, I still remember with Poindexter in Washington, somebody said, what do you think about AI? And both of us said, this is 30 years ago, both of us said simultaneously, they're ignoring the training data. Yeah, I worked on submarine recognition systems, all right? We knew that the training data from experienced commanders was far more important than actually raw data. You needed that human element in the data as well. Great. Um, let's see a couple of questions here from Maru. Um, do you know appropriate tools to manage emergence in software slash products? Well, we developed one. It's called SenseMaker. So I'll declare an interest there. That came out of all our work with DARPA and counterterrorism and weak signal detection. Yeah. So, I mean, the key thing about SenseMaker is it, it allows mass generation of data, but critically, whoever provides the data adds a human metadata layer to it. So it's human interpreted data we use, not just raw data. Mm -hmm. And there were two big programs in DARPA. So one was total information awareness, which is like modern big data, you know, which got John into a lot of trouble with the Congress. The other one, which I led with SRI from Miller Park, was about human sensor networks and human metadata. And that was focused on creating better training data sets. Yeah? So for example, when we do mass engagement of the workforce, it's not done with a sort of social media type contribute your ideas. It's done in ways that nobody knows what the right answer is and nobody can gain the result. Mm -hmm. right? So you shift up a level of abstraction that gives you objective data. And then you can see what are the stable patterns and what are the non-stable patterns. And of course, the stable patterns you want, you encourage, you give more energy to. Yeah, unstable patterns that you think are desirable, you try and consolidate and give them direction. So there's a whole process around that. Great, thank you. Um... See here, Alex, is your theory embedded? Uh, is your theory embedded some evolution psychological theories like spiral dynamics? You already kind of answered that. I don't think, but maybe I don't know if you want to. Spiral add. dynamics is a pseudoscience. Yeah. It's got no basis whatsoever in any research. The original material was done by the original guy originated it, worked on a limited sample of his own students over a limited number of experiments and extrapolate from that to humanity. Yeah, you get it. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, and don't get me into jade organizations because that's a religious <laughs> tract. And the guy doesn't even, he only selects the aspects of his cases which support the thesis he wants to support. He completely ignores all the people who Zappos fired in order to make the bloody system work. And he completely ignores the fact that every single case was a, a leader imposing a solution on people. Oh. Yeah, it's, and it's not about, you know, there's stuff you can learn from that, but you'd be much better off going to Mondragon in Catalonia and looking at how cooperatives have evolved. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because there are better structures in that. Yeah, I mean, as I say, the whole Teal concept, it's a religious movement it's one of the work, three worst book, books ever written in Agile because it actually selects aspects of cases which support its thesis. And that's not how you do research. Oh. I mean, it's very nice. And it would be one thing. Reinventing organizations in La Louvre, right? So um, what is, uh, what's the, uh, it says, what the current state of constraint mapping? What's the current uh, state of constraint um, mapping? I'm, I'm trying to find the picture so I can send you. We, we've now got the, the basic symbols worked out. So we're working on, um, there's a whole process on this. If, you, if you're on the, um, the Kinevin Slack group, which is not managed by the community, not by us, there's a video you can watch on that, which will update you. Mm -hmm. So what we're doing is basically saying we map the constraints and we use images and metaphors to do that. And we use the whole of the workforce to do it. And then we divide the constraint clusters into counterfactuals, so things which can't be changed, and constructors, things which are producing replicable change. So remember, I talked about SGI map, that's where that's coming from. Mm -hmm. So we're making that into a series of processes using distributed intelligence to do the mapping rather than workshops. Yeah, so we get more objective results. 
Okay, great. I'm just looking. There's not much left here. Uh, uh, there's this uh, question here. Dave mentioned in one of his podcasts that leaders coordinate decisions and rarely make decisions. You talked about this at the beginning. Um, uh, this is Cam. Uh, at the operational level, yes, but surely the leader has to make the initial decision on strategic matters or make the key decision when presented with all the information by his C1 heads. In other words, the leader has to prove the clear vision and direction on the path forward, especially on the vision to be achieved. Any thoughts on that? You ever worked in corporate strategy? Yeah. It, it's heavyweight politics. I mean, this idea about rational assessment of the data and clear vision, that's not how it works, all right? It's pretty bloody savage, right? Mm -hmm. um, you occasionally get really gifted leaders generally coming out of a crisis. So Lou, Lou Gerstner did very well on this, all right? I worked with Lou. Um, and he made two or three big decisions, but he made them, remember I said, in a crisis, you make decisions to hold your options open. Mm -hmm. So the two big decisions he made is he invested in the next generation of mainframes. And that's kept IBM going ever since. Yeah, and that, that was a good call, right? Because everybody else was withdrawing. The second thing he did is he bought companies in each of IBM's major areas and sat back and watched what happened. Okay, now that's actually how you manage strategy. You hold options open. So yeah, he's making decisions, but remember it's decisions to hold options open, right? So the company I was working strategy from data sciences, we were bought because we understood services. IBM never understood services. And our management became the management of that group. It became IBM Global Services, which was, you know, for a while the biggest group, right? But he had the sense to realize he needed to import management from people who understood the fields, all right? The same buying Lotus for software, yeah, and, and other areas. So if you look at really good decision makers, they generally interact, connect, suggest, they do multiple options, yeah? Mm -hmm. um, the vision stuff, yeah, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't, but show me a vision statement, which isn't a set of platitudes. It's, it's kind of like something you do. Yeah, you, you go and you say, we are going to be the X, Y, Z type of company, or we are going to respect our customer. And there's only so many ways you can say this stuff. And yeah, go through it, do it, it's fine, right? But it doesn't really make that much difference, right? And the reality is you're generally responding, senior leaders are responding to what middle management are prepared to do. Again, you learn this pretty fast, right? is you can have all the leadership direction you want, but you're not going to fire all your senior and middle managers because they're doing the execution. So you're operating with the constraints of what they're prepared to accept or do or whether you can replace or who you promote. Gerstner had a brilliant mechanism, by the way. He, he had the top 300. And every six months, 20 joined and 20 left. All right, so it was a pretty savage environment. I used to do the training of them, yeah? And the thing he always said to them is, so far you've succeeded by achieving your numbers. Now you're going to have to achieve your numbers and work with other people. And he said, very few of you will make it. And he was right. Yeah, about one in 10 succeeded in making the transition. Right. Um, and again, that was what he was doing. Coming back to my energy gradient, he was managing interactions and managing context to allow things to emerge, which he could then reinforce. Great. That's given me a couple of thoughts or things to think about. Um, I think we've, uh, I don't know if there are any questions or people, maybe the, uh, while well, people think, or is there anything else that you would like to ask Dave? I might have a couple more, but. Um, no, I'm that... open. I, I came on with a, whatever you want to talk about. So. Yeah. So Maru. Uh, yeah, I have many, a whole stack of questions, a whole graph of questions that I'm burning my tongue, but I'm going to select one, yeah. try to make it as concise and self-contained as possible. Um, what do you think people should approach constructing useful frameworks to understand or make sense of where the company is and what strategies they should build? The, the goal here is to do competitive strategy, but what do you think they should approach how do you think they should approach building frameworks so that they can make sense of where they are and where they should go? I think good frameworks emerge 
Yeah. If, if you look at Canavin, for example, it's 22 years old now. And it's gone through multiple migrations and changes in that time. Frameworks don't work if they're based on a limited number of cases. It is with well, the big problem with SAFE. I mean, SAFE is based on Dean's memory of three or four projects. That's the basis of it. That's where it comes from. Yeah, it, it, in terms of its background. So frameworks need to evolve. They need to be a mixture of theory and practice, and they can't just be put in place. Right? And frameworks should also allow for diversity. The problem with agile is the frameworks are confused with the methods. All right, so Scrum is not a framework. Scrum is a really good collection of methods. If you think of it as a framework, you end up in the method the, the wars, yeah? I mean, I still can't see that much difference between Scrum and Kanban, but I mean, I get into trouble every time I say that. And I just quote Tolkien back, you know, that was to sheep, other sheep appear different or to shepherds. But um, yeah, at the, the, the level you, you should be working at, it's not a big difference, all right? So I think, Frameworks need to be theory-based, they need to evolve, they need to create structure, but they do, shouldn't bind you into a single proprietary approach. And I'll give you another illustration on this. There were three things which came to form the Agile Manifesto. So there was XP, Scrum, and DSDM. Now, there are two interesting lessons out of this. DSDM, if you don't know it, I was one of the three founders of that, along with my equivalent at Logica, and Ed, Ed Holt from Cambridge, right? And we met in a pub in Cheltenham and that's how it started. You know, we didn't need a ski resort for a week, dinner in a pub was enough, all right? Um, so that came in and that introduced Rad, Jad and OO and all sorts of good stuff. You then had XP, which is to my mind, really the heart of our job. Um, but nothing could scale around XP because it was experience-based and quite esoteric, whereas Scrum was codified and abstracted to the point where it scaled very quickly. And that was where things went wrong, because not that Scrum wasn't any valuable, but it created this proprietary scaling with training with certification thing that everybody else then followed. Yeah? And nobody went back and thought, is that the right thing? So what we're now talking about in terms of rewilding Agile, as I say, is decomposing methods into their lowest coherent components. And there's like three things in SAFE, which they haven't borrowed or stolen from other people. So we can put those in that category. And instead of taking that massive diagram, yeah, you basically take the bits which work for you and put them together in different sequences. I put some of the cards in, in the thing so you can see what we're doing there. And actually that's what people really do with the frameworks anyway. They, they never implement the whole framework. They kind of like work out what will work and they adjust it and they just go under the, the radar. And that's a hugely inefficient approach. Yeah. So frameworks need to be generic and they need to be at least, they really should be method agnostic. Uh, yeah. So what you're saying then, and I think, you know, we've talked about this before, but it's like the future and really what works is where organization constructs its own framework and evolves it rather than saying we're doing safe or we're doing this, right? I, th I think you're talking an assembly, not a framework. Yeah. So, organize, and it, I mean, somebody just asked about Ivor's work. We, we've reached a provisional agreement with Ivor Jackson that will move his stuff, will stay as it is, but aspects of it will move across into the hexagon structure I've shared you. Yeah. So, that, that's actually underway at the moment. Um, and again, that's a sort of similar approach. It's kind of, it, it's, it is trying to break things down into essences. So we don't think there are such things as essences, but the work then we can work with, all right? So we need much more of this, well, I call it coherent heterogeneity. What the big frameworks does do is they homogenize. Mm -hmm. And so you've got to choose it. What coherent heterogeneity does is it says things can be different provided they're coherent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so the hexagons I've just shown you are our attempt to do that. You can make things coherent by allowing them to combine in different ways. But th that also alludes to like organization developing uh, competence in understanding this and involving more in developing internal employees rather than relying consultants to come and tell it them. It does. And part of what we're doing as well is to build a lot of knowledge into the artifacts. So, for example, if you look at those hexes, they get down to a method that you can understand. There's QR codes you can scan, which will take you to a wider source and such like. So you can build a lot 
into artifacts you know without the need for people necessarily to have the same level of training we can't like prove this in ibm it's this is an approach we adopted you can't expect anybody to be expert in all of the things available yeah so you need to allow them to become expert when they need to but make it easier for them to choose what they're going to do in different combinations yeah. so for example one of the packs we put into here which is a sense maker pack we haven't put in sense maker we put in applications of sense maker yeah, so do i want to do a cultural scan yeah do i want to do distributed ideation so we put those in as things that people can understand on the surface and then they can dive deeper into how they do it later Great, thank you. Um, we might have time for one more question. Anybody? What about, uh, I'm interested just maybe on, <laughs> last time I spoke, I was surprised that you said our response, generally speaking to COVID was pretty good. Uh, do you still think about uh, that it was pretty good? and? Uh, uh, any any thoughts now? I think it's been a year. Yeah, I, I think it's amazing we didn't have more riots. I mean, the riots are now coming, yeah, but they're far less than we thought they would be. Um, what I think is really disturbing is the way that it, it, it's... Sorry, I'm having this debate with Jim Rutt and others at the moment. I'm trying to decide whether Jim Rutt is just... basically has bad ideas or he's a bad actor. I haven't decided which yet, right? Um, what you've now got is you've got far right money. The minute there's something which is because there is this libertarian belief. Sorry, I work in this field, right? There's a libertarian belief that society has to be destroyed for something new to emerge. Yeah, underpins the game A, game B stuff, and, and why my name is being linked with gay B, I don't, I don't know. I never agreed to that, right? So you get these sort of things. So what the the minute what happens? The minute is something like the Ottawa thing, money flows in very quickly which is actually why the Canadians were right to close off the money access, because what you're seeing is not that people are being deliberately disrupted from the far right, but they're using money and resources and social media amplification you know, to actually take legitimate process and delegitimize it by expansion. Right? And that's where it's starting to go wrong now. But overall, people accepted lockdowns, they accepted restrictions. I mean, we're about to open up completely in England. What's interesting is the opinion polls say we shouldn't do that. Yeah, people are nervous about it, but we have a prime minister who needs to distract from his hypocrisy. All right, so that's going on that side. So you're now, the danger sign is now, do we come out of this a better species or do we just go back to the old way of thinking? And that's where I think we're going wrong. I think we manage the crisis really well and human beings in a real crisis are always good. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, sorry, that you have you got the like, like you've got this myth in England, all right, of a certain generation. They say during the war, right? It's always during the war. Yeah. Everybody worked together. So why can't we re-energize re that? And you say, well, yeah, but okay, we'll have to get the Germans to invade again to, to achieve it, right? Again, people aren't thinking about the context. So the context of a crisis changes behavior. What good leadership should have done, and it didn't, right? was to find a way to use that behavior to navigate a different pathway out.